And we've been in a series on the book of Ecclesiastes, and I trust that you've been following along with us over the last several weeks and months. If you have fallen behind, or if you're new to ICB, please go online to icbspain.com, or go into the app to catch up with where we are. Every single week builds on the week before, and every single week, the Holy Spirit, through the words of Solomon, has something to say to us, and something he wants to challenge us with to make our lives more in line with where he's leading us, and so we can become more like Jesus Christ. If you remember, we've been talking over the last several weeks, and we've had this main idea running with us, that a meaningful life is not measured by what we get, but rather what we give. The way that the Holy Spirit will work in and through our lives, how we pour out our lives on a daily basis, allowing him to use us is where true meaning comes from, not from things that we amass or that we acquire. We talked last week about the fear of God, and we said this, to fear God is to understand who he is and who you are not. To understand who he is and who we are not, and that only by understanding the greatness and the magnitude and the beauty of who God is and the frailty and limited nature of who we are as humanity do we really begin to fear and understand, respect, and stand in awe of God. Our challenge last week was this, watch your steps and watch your words. I hope this last week as you were going through your daily life, you were watching where your steps took you, watching what you allowed to come out of your mouth and allowing the Holy Spirit to refine you in that process. Today as we look to the end of chapter five and to chapter six of the book of Ecclesiastes, Solomon, through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, will speak to us about something that every person in all of humanity for all of history has dealt with and deals with and it is contentment, contentment. Let's do this, let's pray, and we'll jump into this morning. Gracious Heavenly Father, I thank you for who you are. I thank you because you're here, and you're guiding us and leading us. I thank you because you don't leave us how we were, and you don't abandon us on our own, but you are with us, and you're walking with us every step along this journey of life. God, I pray that you would speak this morning. Lord, we're here today because we wanna hear from you. We want you to work in our lives, we want you to speak to us, and we want to live lives that honor you. And so I pray that as we look to your scriptures this morning, that you would speak, that we would hear your voice, and that we would leave this place ready to follow in your way. Guide us, I ask, in Jesus' name we pray, amen and amen. Have you ever been dissatisfied? Have you ever been dissatisfied, something that happened or something that was going on that you thought would be one way, but it played out differently in your mind. If we're honest with ourselves, we have all had moments where we are dissatisfied, all had moments where contentment was hard to embrace and hard to find, moments along our journey when we thought things would be one way and we realized that along the way, they turn out completely differently. I'm sure that many of you are sitting there thinking right now of situations just like that, If you have lived in Spain any length of time, August for me is full of that. Because August is when I crave all the restaurants that close for the entire month. And every August, I go to my favorite restaurants to find that creepy little sign pasted on the metal door, see ya in a month. And I call Brandy, oh no, the one place is down, let's go to the next one. We meet there, they're closed as well. On and on and on. I have pictures every year of me weeping in front of certain places. (laughs) Disappointment. Or moments along the way when you have one expectation and something happens totally different. A few years ago, we were taking a trip to Madrid, and I always caution you, be careful if you go there, because they support Real Madrid. (laughs) But we were on this trip, and we thought, you know what, let's take the family with us. I had some meetings in Madrid, and so we were like, you know what, let's drive there. It's gonna be an awesome time together. Three kids in the car for seven hours. What were we thinking? You're right, two kids at the time, that's better. (laughs) And we thought, we'll drive there, we're gonna have a great time together. And on the way there, it was pretty good. We sang a lot of songs, we had a good time together. Our pretty much our history of family road trips goes like this. First 20 minutes, a lot of singing. Next seven hours, everyone's asleep but me. (laughs) We get there and we got to the hotel that we were staying in and began to have our meetings and of course, on that particular day, Real Madrid was playing and the place was full of Madrid fans, which some of you think, is that so bad? It was terrible. I'm very much for Barca. <laughs> I love you, Ruthie. And Nick, the two Madrid fans in the room. 
And I remember getting in there and they were just jumping everywhere, screaming these horrible statements like Ala Madrid and things like that. And they kept getting louder and louder. And if you've ever been around kids that are small, when everything else around them gets louder, they get louder and whiny. And so our kids started getting louder and whiny and our conversation went from being pretty good to really not great to really deteriorating and Brandy's giving me that look like do something and I'm looking through my notes of how to be a dad of what to do that no one gave me. And finally I was like, you know what, let's just pick up another time, let's go get some lunch somewhere else, let's get out of here. So we take the kids, we get in the car, go to start the car, car doesn't start. I'm like, come on. It was bad enough with the Real Madrid fans. Now the car won't start. And so we call a taxi and go to lunch and a tow truck comes and takes our car to the place where they're gonna try and fix it. And as we're eating lunch, I get the phone call that says, oh, your car won't be ready for another week or two. And I'm thinking, we're seven hours away from home. And as I'm on this phone call, having this news given to me, one of my kids reaches for something across the table and spills my coffee con leche all over my pants. And I'm going, really? I'm pretty sure one of them got sick and threw up on something shortly after that. We get in the train and we're like, you know what? We'll just take a train back to Barcelona. This trip has not played out like we thought at all. We'll just take the train home. We'll get in at like one o'clock in the morning, but at least we'll be home. We take the train and travel. The kids are getting more and more whiny. Also, maybe somebody else is getting whiny. Not Brandy. We get home, we go into our door, and as soon as we open our door, we realize our house has been broken into and everything's thrown everywhere. I'm going, really? All we wanna do is sleep, and now it's been broken into, and right then, my little daughter, at the time about two and a half, three years old, runs over and goes, I'm tired, hold me, and knocks my phone out of my hand, and the screen shatters. <laughs> I was like, you know what? We just need a do-over today. This is completely not what we envisioned for this trip. Now, thankfully, most of that was replaced with insurance and emotional work has been done in my own soul and heart. But if you've been there before where you were dissatisfied, where something didn't play out the way that you expected it to, you know what this is like. And as we look to the scriptures today, to Ecclesiastes chapter five and six, Solomon is going to point us towards the idea of moving into a place where we're living a life of contentment. Now, there's a difference between contentment and satisfaction, being content and being satisfied. Some people use those words interchangeably, but really, they're very different in this way. Contentment is to live at peace, enjoying the life that you've been given. Satisfaction is to want nothing more. When you're satisfied and you want nothing more, and when you're actually living at peace with where you are, where God's placed you, and enjoying the life that he's placed you in. So today, as we look to the scriptures, we will see Solomon through the Holy Spirit pointing us toward this idea that we should live content, but not satisfied. Content, but not satisfied. Ecclesiastes chapter five and verse 18, Solomon is talking about life once again. He says, behold, I have seen to be good and fitting it is to eat and drink and find enjoyment in all the toil with which one enjoys and toils under the sun, and the few days of his life that God has given him for his lot. What is Solomon saying? He's saying, look, wherever God has placed you, whatever life he has given you, it is good to be content, to be at peace, to enjoy the life that God's given you. And he's helping us to understand that if we do not live in contentment, that we're missing something fundamental in our lives. Ecclesiastes 6.3 continues on. He says, a man may have a hundred children. Sounds terrifying. We have three and it feels like a hundred in summertime. A man may have a hundred children. What is he saying? He's saying, look, children are a sign of blessing. He says, you may be as blessed as you can be. You may have more inheritance than you know what to do with. In all fairness, he had 700 wives to help with these hundred children. And he says, you may have a hundred children and live many years, be blessed and live a long life Yet no matter how long that person lives, if they cannot enjoy their prosperity, enjoy and be content in the life they've been given, and they do not receive a proper burial, it, I say that a stillborn child is better off than he is. Now that's a strong statement, okay? What Solomon is saying here is he's saying, look, if you are blessed and if you have a long life, but if you are not content in the life that God has given you, then it is better off if you weren't even born. 
Because he's saying, look, if you don't live a life of contentment with Christ at the center, God guiding you along this journey, then you're wasting the blessing and the life that he's given you. Don't waste your life. Ecclesiastes 6, 7 and 9 continues and says, everyone's toil is for their mouth, yet their appetite is never satisfied. Better what the eyes see than the roving of the appetite. This too is meaningless, a chasing after the wind. Here Solomon is helping us understand humanity constantly wants more. That there's this appetite that humanity has, that when it's about satisfaction, we will never be satisfied. He talks about this, that we need to move from the idea of searching for what's next, what will come, this thing that we don't have that will hopefully bring satisfaction and instead sink into this idea of being content. Now we'll look at what that means a little later on, the satisfaction and content that God allows us to step into. But I wanna ask this question first. What happens when we are not content? What happens when we live in such a way that we are not content? I want you to write these down, or if you have your phone, take a picture, because I want you to look at this, and the next slide we'll put up in a minute over the course of the next week, and I want you to be honest with yourself. This morning, I want the Holy Spirit to speak to you and to all of us, myself included, about the different areas of life when it comes to contentment. When we are not content, it often leads to fantasy, addiction, anger, depression, Victim mentality, frustration, bitterness, envy, and jealousy. Look, this list could go on and on and on, okay? These are just some of the top ones that I put down, but often when we are not living a life where we're content in what God is doing and where he's leading us and what he's allowing us to be in, we fall into fantasy. I know people all day long that will fall into these traps where they'll get lost in worlds of video games and movies and activities and hobbies and events and pornography and all kinds of things where they are trying to have some escape from reality because they are not content with the life that they're living or addiction that comes in to try and mask a pain or a wound that is deep inside. Anger, when we allow anger to rule the way that we live each and every day. Depression, victim mentality, you can tell whenever we or you or anyone else is dealing with a lack of contentment and a dissatisfaction because they walk around with this victim mentality. I just wish that my life wasn't so hard. I wish that I had what that person had. If I lived your life, you would know it would be much better. If you lived mine, you would understand what I've been through, that victim mentality. Frustration, and this one is so hard, okay? Frustration is so hard, especially in summer when it's hot. How many of you are hot? I'm very hot right now, and in general. We spend the better part of like two and a half months hot, and our temper goes, our fuse is much shorter. And if we're not careful, we become discontent and dissatisfied. And if we're not careful, we allow the things that are pushing our buttons to make us react in frustration. I was talking the other day with Brandy, and we were having this wonderful conversation. Our kids are out of school for the summer, praise the Lord, and it's wonderful. And also, it's frustrating because it's hot and they're crazy and wonderful. And there was a moment where everything just kind of crescendoed and she was like, I love them so much, but I am so needing a break right now. And I totally understood. (laughs) Sometimes if we're not careful, the frustrations that we're feeling will cause the situations that are gifts to be ruined, to be spoiled. Bitterness will come in. If we're not careful, bitterness takes a root because we're not content in the life that God has given us. Envy, jealousy, looking at everything else everyone has. However, if we allow ourselves to step into this life that is content and live in a way that is content the way that God invites us to, it leads us to meaningful living. It leads us to a place of peace. It leads us to joy and wholeness, balance, kindness, forgiveness, and celebration of others. I love that celebration of others because when we're living a life of contentment, what happens is we come to the place where we willingly, happily celebrate others in a beautiful way. When's the last time you celebrated someone else? When's the last time you were excited for someone for what God was doing in their life? If you're living a life that is content, celebration is a natural byproduct. So this morning, I wanna look at this. How do we live contented lives? How do we live in a a posture where we are content with uh, what God is doing on a regular basis? 
And I wanna look at three things from scripture this morning that I think will help us in this process. The first one is practice gratitude. Practice gratitude. I'm always amazed when I get into conversations and I see the way that people speak. Gratitude is something that we should be practicing on a regular basis, celebrating the beauty of what God is doing in our lives on a daily basis. But so often we get in these rhythms, these habits, these patterns of looking at all the things that are going wrong, of looking and almost celebrating the negative things more than honoring God in the beauty of what he is doing. Contentment is not pretending as though everything is perfect or fake. Rather, it is making the decision to fully enjoy the life that God has given us, gratitude. It's not about pretending as though everything is perfect. Look, everything will not be perfect in your life. Everything will not be perfect in my life. Everything is not perfect in my life. It's not about being fake. It's about making the decision to fully enjoy the life that God has given us and to celebrate and practice gratitude. I had someone not long ago say to me, John, but that's easy for you to say, you're a pastor. And I don't know what they meant by that, but I think they thought I wake up in the morning singing songs of praise and worship and I go to bed with the Holy Spirit and angels flying around my bed. It does not happen. Sometimes I wake up singing, but rarely, and you don't wanna hear it. <laughs> Look, the reality is, is that we all have issues, okay? And we have to practice celebration. We have to practice gratitude. We have to make it a posture of our heart. And someone said to me, John, but you don't know what it's like to suffer, do you? I said, well, I know what it's like to suffer. I've had loss. They said, well, have you ever been in pain? I said, I have experienced pain. I'm not saying this for pity, but I'll tell you this. For the last three years, there's not been a day in my life that I've not had pain. I have back issues. I've had back issues for a while, and I'm in therapy and all those things, trying to allow the doctors and God to lead me toward wholeness. It's not fun. I do not like physical therapists. They're my least favorite people in the world. They hurt me. But for the last three years, every single day, I've felt pain. Every single day, I've had to deal with this, okay? Wake up in the morning, and after about a 20-minute stretch, I can stand up straight several times during the day. If you're around me, you may see me doing some weird pose to try and stretch my back out. For a while, most people did not know. I would stand here doing praise and worship, and afterwards, I would go stand over there on the side, and I would wait until it was time to come speak, because if I sat down, I couldn't stand back up to come and preach. Thank God I'm a little bit further down the journey than that. I know what it's like to have pain every single day, but that does not dictate my joy. That does not dictate the way that I speak or the way that I celebrate or that I look for what God's doing in beautiful ways all around me. Look, you will have pain in life. Celebrate what God is doing. You will have hard moments in life that do not make sense. Let gratitude be at the center of your heart. We cannot allow the things of life that would cause issue or pain or in some way cause us discomfort to stop us from stepping into a life that is full of contentment that God invites us into. It has nothing to do with our circumstance. It has to do with the posture of our heart. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 16 through 18 says, Rejoice always, always. Pray continually. Give thanks in all circumstances for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. He's saying, look, in all situations, in all circumstances, no matter what's going on, give thanks and rejoice. Hebrews 13 and 5 says, keep your lives free from the love of money. Doesn't mean you can't make money. He says, keep it free from the love of money and be content with what you have. Because God has said, never will I leave you and never will I forsake you. Now, I love that verse. Because it says, don't let this be your focus, be content. And then he pulls a quick change, because why? Not because you'll always have what you wanna have. He says, because I will never leave you nor forsake you. He's saying, no matter what you go through, I'm with you. No matter what you may experience, I'm there. No matter what happens, I will not abandon or forsake you, I am with you. Gratitude touches the Father's heart. Gratitude touches the Father's heart. When we practice gratitude, it touches the heart of God. I am a father, and I love my children. They're wonderful most of the time. And whenever I do something, I don't do it in a way that I expect them to be grateful to me. I understand they're children, and sometimes they miss it. 
But I can tell you this, when I do something for my kids, whether it's something big or something small, and they come back to me on their own accord, if I say, say thank you, that's one thing. But man, when they come back in, and I didn't have to remind them or tell them, and they come in and they give me a little kiss on the cheek, and they're like, thanks, Daddy, I appreciate it. My heart grows like 20 times the size. I'm like, ah, they hear me. They're growing so well. They know what's important to my heart. Brandy, did you see? She's like, oh, I know. That's me and them. <laughs> well played. But whenever we have a posture of gratitude, a heart of gratitude, and we come back to the Father on a regular basis, no matter what we're walking through, no matter how complicated it is, no matter how dark it may seem, or no matter how many questions we may have along the way, when we come back with a heart and a posture of gratitude and we say, God, there's a lot of things I don't understand still, but thank you for these things in my life. Thank you for what you're doing in these areas. Thank you for your grace and your mercy that I don't deserve. Thank you for your forgiveness. Thank you for the strength that you offer. It does something to the heart of God, and he says, that is my son, that's my girl. So I wanna invite you to practice gratitude. I wanna invite us to do it now. I wanna pause for just a minute, and right where you are, right where I am, we're gonna do this. I want you to close your eyes, and I want you to allow the Holy Spirit to speak to you about how he's been working in your life, and I want you to practice gratitude. Thank him for the goodness that he's been doing in your life. We're gonna do this for just a second, and we'll continue. God, we thank you for your goodness on our lives. God, we thank you for your provision. Father, we thank you for the health that you've given us. God, we thank you for the life that you've given us. God, I thank you that you provide on a regular basis. I thank you for the food that you give us. I thank you for the shelter that you've allowed us to live in. I thank you for the clothes that we are wearing. I thank you for the children you have blessed us with. I thank you for this church. It's your church. I thank you for this city, and I thank you for what you're doing and where you're working and how you're leading and guiding us. I thank you for your mercy, your forgiveness, and your grace. We're grateful. Thank you. I want to encourage you on a regular basis to practice gratitude. I want to encourage you when you wake up in the morning to practice gratitude and when you go to bed at night to practice gratitude. Make it a daily discipline of what you do. I have friends that will write down in a notebook or somewhere where they'll see it or on their phone in a note things that they are grateful for every day. Brandy wears three little rings that have our kids' names on them as a reminder of the gratitude she has for the blessing that we have. So every time she looks down, she says, thank you for our children, Lord. Make it a daily discipline every day to practice gratitude. The second thing this morning is this, trust God. Trust God. Now look, I know whenever I say trust God, our first thought is, oh yeah, of course, we're supposed to trust God. But I would follow that up with a question, do we really? Do we really? If we want to live a life of contentment, we've gotta trust God. We have to actually believe that his ways are higher than our ways and that his thoughts are higher than our thoughts and that he's inviting us into a life that we do not craft for ourselves but that he is the architect of and the author of. But if we're honest with ourselves, we don't usually do that first off, do we? Myself included. We get into this rhythm where we use all of our own logic, talents, abilities, strengths. We do everything that we can up until the point we don't know what else to do, and then we go, mm, I'm a little lost here, God. Could you help? I had a moment not long ago we had gotten our girls these little cups when we were traveling once. They were made of porcelain and some of the tourist shops that we went to. And we had brought them back for them and they were supposed to use them only when we were all drinking tea or something together. And on this particular day, one of them went and got it without us knowing and she shattered it everywhere. Well, what did she do? She picked up all the little pieces. She went and got the super glue out of the drawer where the glue is. And she came to me and she goes, hey dad, 
I'm like, yes, my love. She's like, um, so the cup you gave me, it fell. I'm like, it fell by itself, a miracle. <laughs> it's amazing how many things have their own mind and their own actions in our home. It fell and she comes with all these little pieces and she goes, but I was just wondering, could you fix it please? And I got the glue and puts it on my desk and kind of runs off. Of course, I'm like, yeah, sure. Then I look at it, I'm like, oh my word, there are so many pieces. Starting to look online if I can order another one from Amazon, you know, no luck. But so often that's what happens with us. We do what we want to do in our own strength. We do what we do in our own ability. We do what we do in our own understanding of what we want to happen, and then when it all hits the floor and shatters into a billion pieces, then we come to God and we're like, Psst, could you fix my life? Could you fix my relationship? Could you fix this situation? <laughs> Thanks. I love you. What would it look like if instead of waiting until everything was broken into a billion pieces, we came to him first and trusted him first? What are you trusting this morning? What are you putting your confidence in? Are you putting your confidence and trust in him or are you trying to do it in your own strength and ability? Philippians 4, 11 and 12 says, I'm not saying this because I'm in need, Paul is speaking, for I have learned to be content, I like this, whatever the circumstance. I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content. Wait a second. This is good. I've learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or living in want. He's saying whatever the situation, whatever the circumstance, here's the secret. I can do all things through him who gives me strength. He's saying, look, you want to know how to be content? Rely on God. You want to know how to be content no matter what your circumstance? Trust God. It is in his strength and in his way that we find contentment. If you're not content this morning, I might suggest that maybe you're not trusting God. Maybe you're trusting something else. Jeremiah 17, 7 says, but blessed are those who trust in the Lord and have made the Lord their hope and their confidence. I love that he doesn't just stop there saying, blessed are those who trust him, because that would be good. He says, but even further, those who make God their hope and confidence, that when we step into this, this posture of living, we don't just come to him for our wants. He is our hope, and he is our confidence. And Romans 10, 11 says, as scripture now says to us, anyone who trusts in him will never be put to shame. I love that scripture. Anyone who trusts in him will never be put to shame. Why? Because he is trustworthy. And whenever he steps into our story, it doesn't mean it will go the way we want it to. It means it will go the way he knows it should. And so he will not put us to shame because he is leading and guiding us. Jesus never said it would be easy. He said he would be with us. And the third thing this morning is this. Adjust your attitude. Adjust your attitude. I don't know about you, but um, I don't like this one. On a regular basis, I have to adjust my attitude. On a regular basis, I have to search my heart to see what is there that is John and what is there that is not good. On a regular basis, I have to battle with things like the frustration and anger I feel when it's hot in Barcelona. When my buttons are pushed and I'm on my last um, ounce <laughs> of sanity. And the Holy Spirit will speak to me. And also Holy Spirit Junior, Brandy, will speak to me and tell me my attitude is not right. On a regular basis, our attitudes are out of alignment. So often, instead of celebrating the beauty of what God's doing, so often of celebrating and being grateful for who he is and where he's at work in our lives, we come with the wrong attitude, don't we? We come with a complaining attitude instead of a grateful heart. I'm amazed at how often it's just ingrained into who we are as humanity that we go straight for the negative, straight for the things that are depressing, straight for all the things that are wrong, instead of saying, God, thank you for what you're doing that is good and right and true in my life. So often we have a complaining attitude. So I want to ask that question right now. 
Do you have a grateful heart or a complaining one? Is the posture of your heart, the way that you initially react to a situation, is it the negative, is it complaining, is it pointing out all the reasons why it shouldn't work, or is it first saying, God, I believe that you are working, and so I first celebrate you. I honor you for where you're actively at work. I honor you for what you're doing. I trust you where you are. Now I've got a few things that are kind of bugging me and I'm kind of worried about. God's not intimidated by our doubt. He's not intimidated by the things that we struggle with. But the posture of our heart should not be to point out everything that's wrong to him and then come through and go, but thanks also for taking care of everything else. No, our posture should not be a complaining one. It should be one of celebration of who he is and what he's doing. Instead of complaining about what we do not have, we should celebrate and be grateful for the lives that we do have. What's the posture of your heart? What's the attitude that you're living with day in and day out? We've got to have the right attitude. We've got to allow him to speak into those moments and guide us. He's at work in your life. He is at work in my life. The Holy Spirit is at work every single day in your life. He's at work every single day in my life. And I will tell you this, there have been moments because of my attitude that I missed out on something he was trying to lead me into. There have been moments where I know looking back, I know, and I probably knew then that God was wanting to use me to show love. That he was wanting to use me to bring peace. That he was wanting to use me to fight for unity. That he was wanting to use me to point someone towards him, but my own attitude stood in the way. I don't want to live that way. I want to be able to step into the contentment that he's inviting us into to live at peace and enjoy the life that he offers us. Now, someone says to you, look, and people have said to me, John, does that mean that we just stop where we are? That we no longer want anything beyond where we are right now? Not at all. We are to be content, but there's a place where dissatisfaction is okay, and it's this, holy dissatisfaction. Holy dissatisfaction happens when you see something that is not right or just, or you have an unshakable urge that something must change. So I'm not saying that we have to just stay where we are and never move forward. Look, I have a son, and he just turned 14 months old, and he is amazing. He's the size of a three-year-old, at least 14 months. And it's fun to watch him grow, okay? It's really fun. So Brandy and I are watching him every single day, and everything that he does is amazing, right? And so he just started walking like two weeks ago. We were not encouraging him to walk. Your first child, you're like, come on, you can do it. Your last one, you're like, please take your time. <laughs> he started walking and we're like, that's amazing. You walk, not well, but he walks. And he says like four words, it's amazing. Okay, five or six. Dada, mama, baba. <laughs> Yasta, he says yasta. <laughs> His next word, cafe con leche, no. <laughs> he has eight teeth, woo! But does that mean in the midst of everything that is so beautiful and is so exciting to us that I want him to be the same size his whole life? Absolutely not. Do I want him to only have eight teeth when he's bigger? That would be creepy. If you only have eight teeth, I apologize. Do we want him to only say the same five or six words his entire life? No, our hope is, our heart is that he will keep growing the way he's supposed to to become the man he's supposed to be. But we're still content with who he is right now. We celebrate every step along the way of his little life right now. And so I want us as a community of faith to understand that God is inviting us to be fully content with the life that he's given us, but not satisfied in the things that he invites us to grow in. I love this church. I love you. And I'm so content with who we are, but I am not satisfied with where God has brought us. There are too many people that still need to know Jesus Christ. I am so grateful for the discipleship that happens in this church. I'm so grateful to the groups that every person here is in. If you're not in a group, join a community group when it starts in the fall. But I am not content only 
have this holy dissatisfaction that says we must go deeper and know God's voice more profoundly. Am I content? Yes. Am I satisfied? Never. Because I believe that God is working and moving in such a way that he invites us to not only embrace the life we're in, but to trust him for where he's leading us, but not in the way that we craft the story, in the way that he does. Am I content that we go out and feed the homeless? Yes. Am I satisfied? No, because there's more people that have no food. Am I content that we do prayer walks in the Raval and walk down by the red light district and pray for freedom? Yes, am I satisfied? No, because there are people that need freedom and hope and life change in a profound way. You and I are invited to understand that there is contentment to be had in the life that is offered. To celebrate every single day and practice gratitude in what he's doing, but then to allow the Holy Spirit to do something beyond that contentment that is to stir up holy dissatisfaction in your family, in this church, in your businesses, with your friends and families, that there must be more that we invite God into on his terms, in his way. Close your eyes. We're going to celebrate in communion. Celebrate what Christ has done. What he continues to invite us into. We need to practice gratitude. We need to trust God. We need to adjust our attitudes. Content, but not satisfied. In just a moment, we're going to pass out the communion elements, a piece of bread and a cup of juice. And I want to encourage you, once you get it, hang on to it, and we'll celebrate communion together in just a moment. But before we go into a time of reflection and prayer, with every head bowed and every eye closed, we always want to pause and ask this question as well. And maybe you're here today and you would say, John, you know what? I'm not a believer in Jesus. I've never made the decision to follow him. I've never made the decision to ask him for forgiveness of my sins, to give me hope and life and a future. But maybe you're here this morning and you would say, I'd like to ask Jesus into my heart. If that's you, I wanna pray with you right where you are. Or maybe you're here today and you would say, John, you know what? I used to be a follower of Jesus. I used to follow in his way, but it's been a really long time since I actually lived for him. And maybe you're here this morning and you would say, I could really use a fresh start. If that's you, I wanna pray with you as well. With every head bowed and every eye closed, if that's you and you wanna accept Jesus into your heart, or you say, John, I need a fresh start today, right where you are, would you raise your hand so I can pray with you? Yeah, I see you, I see you. I need Jesus in my heart, John. That's you, throw your hand up right back down. Yeah, okay. I see you. I see you. I need a fresh start. That's you, put your hand up right back down. Yeah, okay. Okay. Let's do this. To support our friends that raised their hands, let's pray this prayer together. Lord Jesus, I need you. Forgive me of my sins. Forgive me of the past. Come into my heart. I accept you as the son of God. Give me a fresh start. Give me hope and a bright future. Life here and eternal. And the Bible says if you ask him to come in, that he does, that he gives you a fresh start. It says the old has gone and the new has come, and you're a new creation in Christ Jesus. So if you raised your hand, if you meant that with all your heart today, congratulations, welcome home. At the end of our gathering, we've got a next step table here in the back. We would love to meet you there, to pray with you, to believe with you, to give you a Bible and some information on how you can go deeper in this journey of discipleship that you've begun today. But congratulations, proud of you. And now as we begin passing out the communion elements, I want to spend just a few moments in prayer and reflection.
Scripture tells us that we should examine our heart before we partake of communion. And so I want you to examine your heart. If there's anything that's out of alignment between you and God, this is the perfect time to surrender it to Him. In addition, I want you to be praying and asking the Holy Spirit to speak to you in these questions. Where have you been complaining and choosing to remain dissatisfied? And how is God inviting you to trust and rely on Him? Let's take just a moment in prayer. We'll come back and celebrate communion together.